Uh, hello everyone, so my name is Pascal Sardin. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, to you today Eleona, Eleonora Federici, um, who is going to give a talk uh, for our first Intersection seminar, uh, which is convened by uh, Madame Antonin. Uh, so Eleonora Federici uh, is Associate Professor of English Language and Translation Studies at the University of Ferrara in Italy. Her main research areas are translation studies, language for special purposes, especially tourism and advertising, uh, English language varieties, gender studies, and feminist, utopian, and science fiction, which will be the topic of today's talk. She is currently the president of the Equal Opportunities and Inclusion Committee at the University of Ferrara, where she teaches courses on translation, gender issues, and inclusion. She also co coordinated European projects on translation and memory, and uh, she has published books and articles in international journals. I'll just mention one recent book, um, New Perspectives on Gender and Translation, New Voices for Transna Transnational Dialogues, which she edited with uh, José Santa Emilia. Uh, it was published by Rutledge in 2021, and you can find this book in the library here. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to introduce her talk today, which will be entitled uh, Gender and in Translation, How Science Fiction Can Change Our Binary Thinking. Thank you, Eleonora. Alors, bonjour uh, à tout le monde, <laughs> pour être inclusif. Uh, je ne veux pas parler en français, excusez-moi, mais les talks c'est en anglais. Uh, bon, uh, j'ai... Parce que je suis ici, je veux remercier Pascal, of course, et Pascal. <rire> C'est la deuxième fois que je suis invitée euh, pour Climat. Et cette année, c'est mieux. <rire> je suis euh, professeure invitée à Climat. Alors, je vous remercie beaucoup pour cette opportunité. Bon, j'espère que l'étoile va vous intéresser. Et, bon, vous voir. Non. Non, ça c'est difficile. Hein. Euh, vous verrez, je crois, <rire> des traductions en français. C'est bien, je, je, ne traite, je, ne sais faire, je ne sais comment ils sont. Alors vous pouvez m'aider et me dire comment on doit faire la traduction en français des, des textes que vous verrez. Ça va? Ok, now I switch to English. <rire> Easier. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, just showing some keywords. And our linguists always begin with keywords and words just to explain my title and to explain how I will discuss um, yeah, this topic today. So first of all, as you have understood, the question is gender, not only linguistic, but when we talk about uh, gender representation, because also in literary text, we have representation of masculinity and femininities. And I'm always attracted by science fiction because you can do a lot of things. You can completely deconstruct reality and change it and, and propose something, you know, that is not uh, still, let's say, on, you know, in our real world. Of course, we are talking about translation because the second part of the talk, um, I'm showing some very short, of course, extra byte text. Um, yeah, looking at uh, the representation, the gender representation through language. And uh, this is not only about language, because language shapes the way we think, not language, the, the way we uh, think about the world and we live in our society and we think about ourselves. Um, so it's about how can we discuss um, the idea of gender and binary thinking through translation. Uh, so this is more or less what we are going to do it. So starting from uh, the idea that we can use language in a different way. In Italy it is a very controversial issue. You know, it's in the media since the last 10 years, but a uh, lot of academics are against the idea of, you know, changes in the Italian canonical language to be more inclusive. I don't know how it is in France, you will tell me later. Um, so, on the one hand, yeah, like we have the Academia della Crusca, no? that says well, the language is language, grammar is grammar, and this is not. But the main is the political side, as you can understand. Um, so, it's not easy, you know, in, in the last decades we had uh, a lot of, uh, well, problems, actually, and, you know, the media really representing an idea of... Uh, <clears throat> the normative okay, family, so in Italy, uh, also politically, um, uh, le mariage avec le même sexe n'est pas accepté, okay? 
So we are in a context, okay, where translation becomes political if you change the language. Uh, since I am a theorist, I will say very shortly, very shortly something about feminist theories and practice, so I'm not the only one of course, talking about it. I read a lot of scholar, among which your professor, Pascal Sardin, that has discussed strategies and theories of translating you know, uh, text from a feminist perspective. And yes, uh, choosing science fiction is easier, okay? It's easier because it shows um, the source text, okay, is completely invented. So the grammar of the source text is not um, the standard one. It's completely invented. It's the, uh, there are new languages, so you have to think about how to translate them, you know, and it's f probably, you know, you have less fear when you're, you're talking about something that is represented and not reality. Um, just a few words about language in science fiction. Um, well, probably, do you like science fiction? I mean, there are so many students here, I think they were attracted by also the topic. So you know that in science fiction you have new languages. Which language comes to your mind if you think about science fiction languages? I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. No? We can think about also, I mean, movies or series or TV series that I think you know more than probably. There is Klingon. Okay, yeah, that's the answer. I was waiting for it. So Star Trek and, I mean, it's the one that comes to your mind, even if you Google it, okay? So if you Google from today, linguistic and science fiction, this is the first example. So it's not, okay, a, a, a new topic, but we will see that uh, um, women writing science fiction, you know, use this topic in order, of course, to represent a different um, way of thinking about uh, gender. So just a few words about, uh, yeah, language. Uh, so let's think about the first um, lesson would be about gender stereotype and how you use language in order to talk about uh, men and women to keep to the gender. Uh, so. I wrote in English something that I think is quite generalized all over the world. Now we have the idea uh, that, for example, men don't talk about their feeling, that they are stronger you know, physically. Uh, also that, you know, in, in the past that they were sm smarter, okay? So these are like, of course, stereotype. Um, and at the, opposite, uh, at the opposite, you have stereotype about women. Like, the one that I dislike much is that they gossip a lot. I don't know if it's still... Well, but it's quite, you know... If, if you talk and you go um, abroad, you know, from where you live, you see that some stereotypes are quite general, okay? They are repeated in different cultures. So this is, this is quite interesting. So we have social stereotypes that are reiterated by linguistic uh, stereotypes. So the way we talk about, okay, people. The way we represent... Uh, Masculinity and femininity is one of the first examples that always come to my mind. That's why I'm interested in it is advertising. Now you think about advertising and how women and men are represented in advertising, which kind of product they, you know, they are testimonial of. And yes, I think you, you understand me. This is also very general. It's not only, I think, in the Italian context. And so which word okay, do we use? Um, and the other... Uh, aspect is, you know, inclusive language law, now it's um, a sentence, as I was saying, that at least in Italy, you know, you open a newspaper and every, almost every day is there. So what does it do, what does it mean? What do you think it means to, in, to use an inclusive language? You can reply also in French if you want, I understand, it's just that I won't speak it, I will, I will reply <laughs> in, in English, but I will understand if you speak in French, if it's for you it's easier. What does it mean to be more inclusive in language? I guess it's to write all of the different possibilities in the word, to write both the masculine version and the feminine version, I guess. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this is like one of the first steps that you use, you know, feminine, masculine, so you have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like uh, etudian, etudian, yes. Way to make it look like people are equal. Yeah. Like put people on the same uh, level, but it's just, it's just appearances. But yes, this is the main idea that yeah, you include so you know that there are no differences. That 
yeah, the masculine is not anymore the general for both, okay? Um, yeah, this is the problem with our... Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hands. No, uh, it's not just appearances, it's just that uh, French language is just sexist, that's it. So, making it inclusive uh, means that it's no longer sexist, uh, and that's important. Yeah. Oh, I agree completely, as you can imagine, yes. In fact, Italian and French, you know, and also Spanish, they have feminine, masculine, they are very clear. So you have, yeah, you know, it's, uh, uh, we use much less than neuter, okay? So they are languages, as I wrote there, that they have, you know, classes. So, and this is what, you know, the Academia de la Crusca says, you know, you have a masculine and a feminine. Now, we are going to see in a few slides here that uh, what I mean by the generic masculine is that in many cases, also in English, you would say the ma mankind, okay? But if you say human beings in a sentence, it's different than saying mankind. You know, you don't have men anymore. Okay, so this is the effort, okay, to create an inclusive language. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, if, I don't know, I mean, if you have read or if you've been to a conference or if you've read this word, but, you know, we say German usually, now you more or less you say just chair, okay, or chair person, okay, so if you use person, it's not like using men. Okay, so this is, could be quite obvious, but in Italy they're still debating about it, you know, with women that says, well, don't call me directrice, okay, I am the director, okay, and this morning I read that one director of a theatre said, okay, many women want to, want to be called director, you can call me directrice, okay, but this is... <laughs> I don't know that now there will be, I think, for 10 days or more, probably responses to that, you know, because it's not. So this is what I mean. I mean, you, you try, you know, to substitute with a non-male word, also um, grammatically. You no, know? so on, on the on the right side you have you no know, the explanation with grammar. On the left we have what I said, social stereotype through language. If I say the doctor, in many cases you think it's a male. Okay. If I say the nurse you think it's a woman, okay? Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this I, I, of course, is not mine because I'm not good at all in, in doing this, so I just bore it. So you can find it online, <laughs> but it's good because, yes, you have um, a kind of, in English, okay, the idea of what is called gender language, so the gender terms that um, you can think about and see if you can find, okay, uh, an option, and if you think about, it's a translation. <laughs> and then if you have to translate into another language, is another translation. So you have to find in, 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 in the target language something similar. And we will see, I will show you some example with pronoun. Oh no, it's easier to, to play with pronouns, but it's, it, it tells us something about, you know, how we refer to people and how we represent them. So this is just uh, yeah, one schema that you can find it. Um, now, there are a lot of um, work. I just, uh, I can leave the, the slide if you want, I can share. I mean, that's no problem because there are just, I, I wrote some kind of references. Um, so this, uh, in, in the Anglophone context, okay, the, the study of language and uh, well, began with the idea of, because also terminology no, differs. No, the idea of inclusion and inclusivity is recent. No, in, in the 70s, 1890s, they would talk about you know, women's and men's language. They would talk about uh, language and gender. Nowadays, you would say, you know, inclusive language. But uh, this is a, you know, there are quite a few uh, social linguists, especially, you know, that um, try to uh, analyze text, different kind of text, you know, to see how um, yeah, words and, and language was used and also uh, conversational analysis because also the way you know, we speak, of course, is connected mm, to our gender representation. Now, why it's so interesting? I mean, your colleague was saying that because we are talking about sexism in language. Okay, so uh, beginning with, you know, maybe in the press. So the first idea probably that could come to our mind is when we look at representation in the press, okay, that uh, we can see how derogatory terms sometimes are used. Not only, I mean, today we are talking about, ge about gender, but, you know, this analysis could be done also for, uh, for example, different ethnicity or race or uh, racial groups. So, but today we are talking about, of course, uh, gender, but it means that you can use <coughs> language in a positive or negative way. And this is also a way to 
uh, be sexist in language. But <coughs> it's also used to the idea that sometimes people do not, I mean, they, they don't think about it, okay? They are not aware of being sexist while speaking. They don't think that the, the word that they choose, okay, are sexist. Uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Okay, sometimes really, we, we in, in the ordinary life, you know, we just speak. Um, so it's, um, in some cases, we don't think about, um, uh, we don't think too much, okay, at the way that words actually have a meaning, okay, and, and of course they, people uh, have a reaction according to the words that you use. Um, but, you know, author, uh, literature, that's why I love literature, because literature teaches us something, you know, that they, the authors know that language is powerful, that depending how you use it, um, yeah, you can, make, uh, you can make a big difference. And, yeah, and uh, you know, science fiction, for example, is also, language is a topic, you know, um, probably you have seen the adaptation of Margaret Hathaway's uh, um, The Unsmaid Tale, I think it's been adapted, translated in any language, probably also, also in French. And uh, this is one example of a science fiction novel where, you know, people cannot speak to each other. Okay, so the topic of silence, of, no, of not communication, is a central one because they know, okay, that uh, um, it tells a lot about, um, it tells a lot about us. Um, okay, so um, on the other hand, of course, the, the, the idea of translating, uh, keeping in mind inclusive language, um, is nowadays is quite developed in the last um, decades you know a lot of theorists of, of um, scholar have uh, talked and discuss uh, how to translate um, keeping in mind also you know, the idea of inclusion uh, in language and uh, um, connected to the idea of the responsibility of the translator so I, I wrote a quotation from Carol Meyer that says it is the responsibility of translator to reflect on their thinking in political terms, to reflect on their motives and on the effect their work might have on the reader. Okay, so translation is not uh, a neutral act. Is the way you know that we were someone was I think uh, Pascal was talking about literature at the apero, saying that you know depending on the different methodology that we can use, of course, so we use different methodology, but. Uh, lit why do we read literature nowadays? Because it's one of the ways to reflect, okay, about, uh, anyway, our society. So readers do not read just to, yeah, they can read because they, of course, just to relax themselves. But while you read, okay, you think about things, okay. So it's uh, uh, the way that a text is translated changes the way reader will read it, okay. So this is, and also, but this is too much, I can go into it today, otherwise I speak too much, you know, but which text do we translate? For example, we translate very little uh, science fiction novel, first of all, at least in, into Italian, and almost nothing by women uh, science fiction writers. So this is another, but this is another story. Um, so just before we look at the text, uh, um, generalize and of course I'm trying to summarize okay what why do we talk about feminist translation I use the term feminist because it makes sense I mean it's uh, as I was saying words are important so I would use the term feminist in a political way uh, first of all uh, because you read the text in a critical way so you should translate it also in a critical way um, second because uh, we know that the linguistic and the cultural context uh, changes okay so we look at anglophone text and then we know that we have to translate it in France for example or in Italy so we have to keep this in mind so going beyond the uh, grammar okay and and different the way that different languages of course are structured um, third the idea that gender uh, is a, an important category in the representation of text and if we look at the text of course that are feminist science fiction, it is, that's for sure. I mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot talk about feminist translation for any text, okay? So it, it makes sense when the text has a very political aim, so you, you, should, you should keep it. And if it's also linguistically, it has a political aim, you should be able to translate it in this way. Otherwise, you change it completely. 
Um, now, the, the fourth is something that, you know, when we are in translation studies, you know, the very beginning when we, we begin to learn about translation is that there are some keywords that are very important, and one is fidelity to the text. Okay, now we go a bit over it, okay, because we can like it, we cannot like it, okay, but nowadays a lot of um, methodologies and theories, not only feminist translation, tell us that anyway you have to change a test a little bit, according, of course, to the reason, I mean, having um, important reason to do that, but the thing that, you know, while you translate, you rewrite the text, okay, this was a completely change in translation studies, okay, from the past, because the past you were a good translator if you were faithful to the text. Now, the idea of fidelity changes, I mean, in this case, fidelity is that I try, okay, to translate inclusive language if I have it, okay, in the source text. So it should be there also in the target text. Now, I don't want to say that personally, okay, I, I think that rewriting a text is right. Okay? I'm saying that you have to adjust text in order to be faithful um, to its uh, main objective, okay, to its main aim. Uh, so a little bit, uh, an idea of fluid, let's say, conception of writing and translation, uh, but is connected to the fact that, you know, language is uh, part of our agency in the world. Okay, so the language becomes one of the most important elements of the text that I have to translate. <clears throat> now, you would say, okay, but if you change a text, um, you will see you know, the presence of the translator. And this is another important, of course, um, uh, issue in translation. I mean, we know that in the past, translators were not so much visible. Now they're a bit more visible. Then it depends on the publisher. You can have introduction, you cannot. You can have you know, paratextual elements like uh, uh, footnotes where you know, the translator explain uh, error his work. Um, it was not like that. So things are changing. I mean, we know that because also in our university we have this. Now we are creating more and more courses on translation and not only literary but also specialized. So, so we understand that, you know, um, the idea of the translator as a professional, okay, has changed a lot uh, uh, through the years. So the vis what I mean by visibility is that you know who is the translator and you can see the work of the translator in the text okay, while you are reading it. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, connected to the idea of performativity. In linguistic you know, performativity means that, you know, you, you act, you know, you, you know that you are doing something, you know, it's not only, it's not only words. So I said already something uh, about uh, translation not being uh, neutral. Let's see, uh, here also I, I borrow it, <laughs> but it's very good. So you can see some stra translation st strategies that are used. I mean, the translation, translation strategies are always the same, okay, but when we translate, uh, yeah, we adapt the text, okay, we can add something, okay, we can omit something, also because languages are different, okay, so we have to do some changes and adaptation. As I was saying, we can use paratextual elements, um, <clears throat> or, and this is the feminist one, we can hijack the text, okay? That is, this is a very controversial issue. You know, people didn't like it. A lot of people didn't like it. Now, I'm going back to the <coughs> Canadians that are, you know, the beginning. We are in the 70s, so quite long ago now, <laughs> if we think about it now. But just to show you, this was the beginning of um, then decades of, of study of translation strategies. Um, so supplementing or compensation is something that we know. Okay, as a translation study scholar, we know that we add some information along with the translation because mainly you not know, the language. The target language doesn't permit us to say the same thing of the source language. So you need to yeah, change it. Because you have to be faithful to the text as we are, we are going back. I mean, you have to communicate okay, the same idea. Um, so we go back to inclusion on in this example very long ago, but les ou la coupable doit être puni. Okay, this is, was in French because it's the francophone side of Canada. Um, that became the guilty one. Or oh, now in, in English, with the, the use of one, okay, they were, they are able to solve a lot of problems. Okay, so the guilty one um, must be punished. But then you have that could be the translation. Okay, but then you have whether she's a man or a woman. Okay, that is going back to the feminine and the masculine okay, in the source text. 
um, yeah, paratextual elements, I have already said something. Now, just to show you what they mean by hijacking, they mean completely changing the text. And this is what, you know, a lot of scholars and theorists didn't like of feminist translation, that they change completely. I can agree. I mean, if... Uh, I can agree if we are talking about texts that have nothing to do with women issue and, you know, feminist issue because you completely change. I don't know about Becker. This is a good question, you know, but you completely change, uh, yeah, a text. You know, if, if the message is completely different, yeah, we can, why would you do that? But anyway, this is an example, but in many cases you could, okay, because thinking about I don't know, maybe Virginia Woolf, that I'm sure Anglophone uh, students probably know have heard about. Uh, well, in this case, no, uh, the message is quite clear. So you, will, you could think about hijack a bit of the text to make it more kind of inclusive. I don't want to say feminine. So the example was La Victoire de l'Homme, that became our victory. Okay. How would you translate this is from French, so you can easier for you than for me. Yeah? It depends on the meaning of uh, la victoire de l'homme. Love the l'homme meaning of all of us. Okay. The l'homme mankind, let's say. Okay. Humankind? Humankind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the problem is the context is key because if, if, if here is a, it's a lowercase h. So without context, you could think that it's about uh, men as in gender, and it could be a feminist and talking about the victory of men. If like you're talking about uh, like how they uh, are more present in popular culture or something, this could have a subtext. So uh, it's actually quite difficult, but uh, sticking to something like a men's victory uh, could be uh, a little bit controversial too, because. Uh, if it's not the, the men in sense of gender or, male, or masculine gender, then there is a there is a problem with the translation because it doesn't reflect what the author is trying to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a very short sentence, so of course you cannot understand. That's why Pascal asked me, otherwise you know this was talking about yeah, when you use the term like yeah, mankind or men, not mankind or humankind, but men meaning all of us, and this is why they translated our, so meaning, you know, something that is shared. Now, the second one, uh, I just wrote it to say, of course, this was a very political uh, way of translating, just to show it. So we're not talking about that, because this is, I know, you know, at the beginning, all revolution is to be very political, then you think how to use it um, and how to do things. So before we look at the text, uh, I ask you, okay, when we read the text, we are going to question, okay, grammatical gender, first of all. We are going to think about how to challenge dominant value in language, French or Italian, whatever. Anyone speaks Italian here? Okay, ah, that's good, so we can, okay. Um, if, you know, we can deal with neuter in translation, uh, how we can break away from an understanding view in scribing language. How we can subvert okay, gender construction representation, um, so also, of course, be visible uh, in the text. Um, now, before going to science fiction, just to show you that I'm, I'm, I will show you science fiction, but you can do it with any text that, of course, where, of course, you know, the idea of gender is important. Uh, anyone uh, knows Jeanette Winterson written on the body? Okay, just, you, you, you just have to know that when you read the text, almost until the end of the text, you don't know if the narrator is a man or it's a woman, okay? So, as a translator, you must keep it, okay? It's, this is the interesting, I always use it in, uh, in my classes because this is nothing to do, okay, with uh, yeah, feminism. It's, it, it has to do with the way the text is written, it's been constructed, so... Part of the plot of the narration is that you don't, you must understand or, you know, think, okay, yeah, it's a woman or it's a man all through the text. So it's part of it. Okay, so you, you cannot discover it at page 10. Otherwise, the translation uh, is, is not faithful to the text. Should that to show you, and this, you see my translation in French. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, so this, you see what the Italian translator did very well. Okay, so you have, uh, for example, I can tell you by now that you are wondering whether I can be trusted as a narrator 
Oh no, in Italian you say narratore or narratrice. Okay, so you have now, now you cannot do it because otherwise, yeah, you are revealing, okay, the, the narrator agenda. Okay, so she said, a questo punto vi chiederete se sono affidabile nel mio ruolo di voce narrante, that is the translation of, I don't know, uh, voix narrative. Does it make sense in, in French? No. Okay, no. so similar to the Italian. So you opt for the same, okay, so you don't know. Now, the second, uh, also, okay, you have a sen many sentences like, you know, her, her lover runs her finger. Now, here, in Italian and in French, the, the possessive, okay, so it's feminine or it's masculine, okay, so the Italian translator wrote l'amante, that is genera, l'amant, uh, Fa scorrere un dito. Now, I don't know how would you translate that because this was very, very difficult. Um, I couldn't understand, you know, how you would translate it. But the important thing here is that you can do the same. So you see similar languages can opt for similar strategies. I don't know if something else comes to your mind. So in the, all the sentences where you have you know, the lover. Um, or here, I was the only one breathing the air. You see that, you know, here she decided to change with a, a, with a change. Um, she says, l'unica persona, la seule personne, je ne sais pas. Mm -hmm. So you don't know. Okay, and here the same, you know, for example, when you have a participle that is gender marked, and also in French is gender mark, okay, so it's, you have to say, ha, your beau, my friend, she changed it completely, she said, no, ecco di cosa si tratta, la noia, that would mean in, in English would be, if you retranslate, if you do back translation, has, what is this about, okay, is it boredom, I don't know if you say, voilà, c'est cela qu'il s'agit, Hmm? Les nuits. I don't know if it makes sense. I didn't ask any. I didn't ask Pascal. So I understand. Doesn't make. To me, it doesn't make. No, it doesn't make any sense. So if you want to say you're bored, you're bored. How would you translate? Tu t'ennuies. Tu t'ennuies. Okay. Ah, tu t'ennuies. Tu t'ennuies. That is impersonal. No. Ah, okay. Tu t'ennuies. Okay. I have to write it down. <laughs> so if you say, my friend said it would be mon ami, and then uh, ami e masculine mm. or or uh, feminine form. So and that's why no, you can use that. Yeah, you have to choose. You have, you have to choose. Yeah, ah. like amant, you have to choose for amant, and you have to yeah. choose for ami. Okay. If you mm. say l'amant, mm. for me it's a man. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. I know. So how can we do it in French? Hey. La personne qui aime, la personne qui aime, it doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. L'amoureuse, no, no, it doesn't work. La personne qui m'aime Oui. La personne qui est dans mon lit. <laughs> <laughs> ah, c'est difficile. Hein? Yeah. Dans, mon, dans mon cœur. Ah, ok. Oh, si. Ah, so more difficult than in Italian. Because at least in Italian, l'amante works. Yeah, like I'm asking. Mon amour. Ah, mon amour. Ah, mon amour. Ah, oui. C'est le doigt amoureux qui peut aussi passer. Le doigt amoureux. Ah, les doigts amoureux. Ah, ah j'aime ça. Les doigts amoureux, c'est... Ça me piace. I like it. Yeah, yeah. So, you see, it's, it's even more difficult. So, something works in Italian, it doesn't work in French. So, you have to, yeah, you have to think about it. Uh, I know it's an effort. I mean, I don't say it's not. Uh, it's an effort to think about it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going all to this. Otherwise, we don't see the... Um, yeah, the, the science fiction text, but yeah, like the impersonal form. No, I was exhausted, uh, era stressante. Mm. I think there is also the French. Um, okay, now let's go to the text, uh, the science fiction text. Uh, here again, uh, something about uh, linguistic and science fiction more general, not only about feminist science fiction. So if you want to have a look at, uh, you can of course Google and find a lot about language and linguistics in science fiction. Someone will recognize from Star Trek the image. 
Uh, and this is to say that, again, it's uh, a more comprehensive uh, issue, okay? It's about, you know, creating languages, proto-languages, alien languages. Um, in science fiction, you have a lot of non-verbal communication. So in many cases, okay, the, the changes in, in the language are also connected to a representation of a society where not communication is different. You know, you can have dystopias where they don't speak, they cannot speak. Well, in some places, people cannot speak, you know, it's dystopian in reality, okay, so. But, you know, this is a representation. Or, you know, you can have language as a theme, like, you know, that you have uh, characters that are linguists, that are translators, that are interpreters. Okay, so you have languages that are prohibited, that you cannot speak. Um, so you have a lot of uh, thematic uh, issues in science fiction. Um, I'm going to show you some example that starts from, again, going back to linguistics, so the, to the Sapir-Whorf idea uh, that language function as a linguistic filter, meaning that, you know, we perceive reality through it. And so language organizes, in a way, how our thoughts and speech is. Uh, so we have concepts, okay, that are, let's say, translated um, through language. And this is connected to the fact that any speaker has a different, of course, uh, perception of the word according to his or her culture. Um, so also, you know, the cognitive processes are conditioned by, let's say, the linguistic system. I'm not going into it, you know, because linguistics is good bits just to, 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 just to know, to, to make you understand, okay, why, okay, uh, and how uh, this author created uh, this text. It's not my idea, okay, because you read interviews you, uh, um, and you understand, I mean, they, they affirm, okay, that they begin with this uh, idea. Um, so, um, adding something more to the um, author intention, talking about is a writer, uh, they, cr they do that because they want to create uh, uh, words and forms of expression that translate a different way of living, okay, a different reality. Um, so, yeah, they, and then they also demonstrate because there is so much about language that the reader, okay, any reader understand uh, that language is the most important, let's say, theme, topic, issue, okay, of, of, of the story. Um, and so, you know, you begin to think tri critically about it. You, you begin to think it is not the way it is written, but, you know, it has, it is a plot device, let's say. That's why you have all this, uh, yeah, let's say, linguistic innovation. So, first of all, because they try to disrupt patriarchal ideas and values, so gender vision of society, as we understood up to now. Uh, and of course they want, you know, to develop their own discourses and uh, so it, be, it really becomes, uh, language becomes a critical instrument. Um, the idea is that English is not adequate. You no, know, they have to change even English language because they think it's not uh, adequate to express okay, some ideas, some thoughts, some experiences. So the new language, you know, should make us think about um, women's experience in that world, of course, uh, that always mirror our world, but in that world. Um, okay, so that's why, okay, we go back to the idea of performativity, uh, that when you say something, you do something, again, a linguist, um, Austin, that we do, I, hope, I think we know, uh, so that, you know, with language, you shape the word, and you create a new word, and the way you act and you speak uh, is, uh, in a way, uh, a performance. So it's also a cultural intervention. So I'm going to begin with now the first book. So this is in our your in your library. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it if you wanna have a look at it. Sure. I borrow it from your library. I couldn't bring all the books with me, so I saw it was there. Uh, now Suzette um Aden Algin was a linguist, so it's easy. <laughs> okay. She was a linguist as a professional, she was an academic and she wrote science fiction novel. I don't know if you ever read any of her book in English. Now, in Italian, uh, this book has been translated last year by a very small publisher uh, called Lingua Madre, Langue Maternelle. Okay. And this mm, native tongue, we could discuss about it, but <laughs> the translation of Lingua Madre 
Okay. Uh, now, this uh, is a very, in, in, in the Anglophone word, uh, it's a very famous text, okay, when we talk about the language and science fiction, because it's all about the language, okay? So you have a kind of ruler uh, class that is made by linguists that are all men, okay? But they, they need the women, okay, to decode and encode in a different way uh, communication among different no uh, planets, let's say, as you know, no, communication among planets, it's a must in, in science fiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you have a very gender representation. What happens? That, you know, it's a trilogy, this is the first. But anyway, it happens that uh, women began to create a secret language. That is called Ladan. Now, and what happened? Because when it was published, you can see, I mean, it's not in the 70s, it's not in, you know, the, the kind of feminist wave revolution, but it is in the mid-80s that the, the, the book was published. But it became so popular, okay, that if you Google it, you find a lot of materials. You find uh, uh, a website that explains to you how the language works, syntactically, semantically, grammatically, with all, you know, like a sort of a grammar. Hmm? But it became uh, so famous, yeah, as you see, that you have this kind of use of the language in t-shirt, you know, that they sell. You know, this is popular culture. It means the people are immediately recognize what it is. And they buy it, maybe, of course, science fiction reader, they like science fiction, but they recognize what it is and they buy uh, you know, the, <laughs> the t-shirt. So just to tell you that, you know, it, it, had, it, it was a, a kind of a, yeah, uh, experimental uh, science fiction novel and you have a lot of explanation and you have the phonetics you know so it explains how you can um, yeah you can actually use it and learn it I'm not gonna go into the tale of the cover books and there will be a lot to, to say about it but you know today we don't do that uh, this is something uh, I was telling you about this is a quotation from the author Okay, that talks about being aware that feminist hypothesis that existing languages are inadequate to express perception of women. Okay, so you have a statement by the author that tells you, okay, I created the language, I uh, created this uh, story, also because I thought about okay, feminist theories uh, know about language. And then there occurred to me an interesting possibility within the framework of the sapi wolf hypothesis. So it's not me, okay, that I thought about it, but... You know, is the author, okay, so we understand immediately, this is in the preface of the book. So a reader of science fiction understood, you know, when you want to buy a book, what do you do? You look at the book cover, the introduction. No, if you are not interested in linguistic, you wouldn't buy that, okay, because you understand immediately what the story is about. So if you choose it, of course, you will be quite aware, you not know, in the reading of the text that you know, this is a, um, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, okay, now, these is, uh, are some examples, so we go back to, uh, let's leave the, the language they use, okay, in the society there, we talk about the secret language here, okay, the women's secret language. Um, okay, so if you look at pronouns, you see that uh, the author says, okay, instead of using e, she, and it, you would use only one, okay, that is be. And be is the verb to be. Okay, that is, of course, we understand immediately is not uh, uh, kind of an optional choice. It's a very, <clears throat> well, she thought about it, otherwise she could have chosen anything else. So in our mind, you know, well, in the mind of, of an English reader, uh, it's the verb, to be. Uh, in import, I, I am, you are, so I mean, it's something not connected to the existential uh, part. But then, if you look... Um, she also tells us that according, okay, to the the way we, the, the context, okay, and what we are talking about, and uh, um, the person we are um, talking to, uh, we can have different pronouns, okay? So if you, if you look here, okay, you see that, well, of course, if we read it, we don't understand. You know, it was when, when we read, a, you know, a language, a foreign language that we do not, we do not know. No, we, it's, it's difficult. But just, we can look, you know, just at the first sight, look that the pronoun E, the masculine, has only one. Okay, one word to translate E. And you have four to translate she. Okay, also, also this tells us something. Okay. <coughs> or it. So, depending, you know, if you want uh, 
to be neutral, you would use the B that is for all of them, okay, all the genders, or depending, you know, what you want to say. And also, if we look at the pronoun we, hmm? so you see it's, uh, yeah, I know it's difficult, but so you, you really need to, there are uh, big chunks of written in this language in the middle of English, okay, so imagine to translate, well, you can leave it as it is, but an Italian reader or a French reader uh, probably would find uh, even more difficult, okay, to read these invented words. Okay, maybe they have some sound, something that in English, you know, makes sense, like you have, oh, sorry, I did something here. You have the she, okay, that in English, okay, you think about the pronoun, but when you have to translate it in Italian and in English, uh, you have to, to, to change, okay? So it's very difficult. This is maybe one of the reasons why also texts were not translated, okay, because you don't only have, like, a little bit of words, like in Klingon, you know, some words... Uh, or some sentences or some formal expression, you have long okay, part of the, sec of the text that are kind of translated. Uh, just another example, okay, you have um, a lot of words, for example, concerning some semantic field, like for example, love. Okay, so for affectionate words, as you can see, uh, you have different words on your left and the translation in English, into English, um, that, you know, mean love, but for, uh, in different senses, like love for inanimate or mysterious love, or love for, you know, one not related by blood, etc. Of course, we do have these also in our languages, this is for sure, but um, it depends. Also, it's quite cultural, okay, so maybe in our culture we have more or less word uh, according to uh, the topic. Um, Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to translate it in Italian and English because it's very, in French and Italian because it's very difficult, but we are going to translate the next one. It, it is a bit easier, meaning that um, um, you don't have the text in your library, so I, I cannot show it to you. Um, but this is a text entitled Women on the Edge of Time. Uh, the, the author is March Pierce, he's an American author. Uh, you just need to know that we are uh, in 2137, okay, we are like the, the, the protagonist is um, considered as mad, okay, so she is in an asylum and she, she doesn't know if she dreams or if she is uh, kind of not teletransported in another world, okay, this is science fiction, so we can believe uh, she's there, she, she changes completely, and she's not in the asylum anymore, I mean, it's better, no, you think she's free. Um, so what happens here, that uh, you have a complete change in gender-specific pronoun, uh, so he or she becomes per, that, of course, in English is a uh, person. So this is easier, no, maybe we can all do the same, so we don't have any more uh, also in the possessive. Okay, so for example, now you have, I am here, I've been trying to reach you, but you get frightened. Uh, well, this is kind of, you know, in science fiction you have uh, the visitor from another planet or another world that comes and uh, takes you somewhere else. Okay, so Connie is the protagonist, the one that is in the asylum, and Luciente is the time traveler, space traveler, okay, that she meets supposedly in a dream but then in reality and uh, takes her to a word, okay, just to make you understand. Okay, so she's, uh, uh, the time traveler is speaking, okay, and really he was girlish is what the protagonist, so that the, the one in the asylum think, okay, so she's <coughs> thinking about looking at the appearance, the way now the other person is dressed, speaks, okay, this we go back to now, the, the idea of femininity. Um, so here, um, the idea it was girlish that seems, uh, well, okay, of course, I don't know, I don't know if my French makes sense, okay, <laughs> but, uh, but remember, this is more important because from here you have one of the first sentences that will be repeated maybe in different ways with different expression of the protagonist always, you know, thinking and rethinking that she doesn't understand if the person in front of her is a man or a woman. Now, this is important. We are in, in 76, okay? We were not, not talking about transgender issue anymore, but this is important because in science fiction, in meant you can have androgynous you know, character. 
and but it's her idea no she's not a, she has to categorize okay the person in front of her I mean, it's, a, it's a woman it's a man i don't know she doesn't understand and this is part of the plot okay so the way we translate uh, sorry so the way we translate he was girlish it's important because we, we know as translator that when you decide to translate something then you have more or less to be coherent and go on but this is an important topic okay of uh, of the plot okay because her ideas and the fact that in many cases not the protagonist think about and changes her mind and at the end you know find it's difficult to go back to where she lives because she sees that you know you can live and, and think about uh, gender categories in a different way you know makes this is the, the, the central okay issue of the plot okay so in Italian uh, would be similar I didn't write it but I asked the, the Italian speaker how you would translate really he was girlish that shouldn't be derogatory should be you know something that begins the idea of more to be perceived as I think okay now you choose femina that is same in French not femme okay and why would you translate uh, uh, femina instead of ragazza, for example? Um, that's a good question. Um, I know. <laughs> I didn't think this through. Um, I don't know, because um, to me, uh, femina gives more the idea of um, perception, attitude, rather than a pure gender. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you are thinking the way she speaks, she's dressed, she behaves. Okay. In French, does it work the same? No, I agree completely. But in French, does it work? That the, the term femme is like uh, the idea of femininity? Of well, what would be the alternative? Uh, the alternative for us, girlish, ragazza. Uh, no, but in French. Uh, Je fille? <coughs> no? Elle avait l'air d'une jeune fille. Uh, I wrote il était. <laughs> yeah, effeminé would be very, very derogatory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't right. say effeminé. No. Because it's not neutral. No, it's not. Yeah, but also feminine is not neutral. Yeah. Right? Mm. yeah, because it's difficult to find a neutral term. Yeah. And the idea is that it could work, I think, at the beginning because it gives you an idea, not that, you know. Well, she's dressed like that, so she is a woman. Now, femina is connected in Italy also to the biological sex. You say femina, maschio. Yeah. Ah, oui, of course. Et si on emprunte au langage queer, le terme femme, mais F-E-M, qui dans ce cas-là est plutôt en pouvoir en que rabaissant, je pense que ça peut être. Enfin, vu que ça questionne aussi le genre, j'ai l'impression à ce moment-là, que femme, F-E-M, no, yeah, no, thank you because this tells us that you know that this was published in 76. Nobody would reply as you do, of course, but nowadays you would think about that. So, thank you very much. So, it depends also when you translate a text. Now, nowadays it would make sense, I think, to translate it like that. I mean, it would be like trying to be faithful to the text. Now, in the 70s, probably um, nobody would think about that. You know, so it means that language changes according you know, to our ideas. And thank you very much. Here, the character is not, he's calling it he and girlish, despite the person uh, being clearly like above gender, if you will. So I think it's, uh, it's meant to, to say that the, the person discovering uh, the person from the future uh, is thinking in binary, while yeah. the person is thinking above binary. Yeah. So I think it would be a mistake to call them because then it, it will show that he is aware of trans issues or something ah. like that. I think it, it, the, the character starts by assuming gender while the other person uh, talks in a non-binary uh, system that is uh, completely new. 
Okay, so you are giving a second option, like that through the text, as a translator, I can, you know, translate, uh, uh, also using maybe negative derogatory terms, and then, yeah, going on on with the thought of the character that changes their mind. Yes. Now, the second one, uh, maybe you, you, you can use persona, for say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, would, you could you do the same, in Italian is persona, so... So this is, uh, yeah. Mm, I guess so. Yeah. Now I must tell you that the, in the Italian it was translated with the masculine and the feminine. So it wasn't, you, you know, it wasn't translated. So they decided that it was difficult to translate per, per and they adopted it. But yes, kind of a long time ago. Oh, now this is my favorite. I'm gonna, this is mine. I'm going to, because it's, you can't find it anymore, only on eBay. <laughs> I found it many years ago. Um, okay, now we go back also at the end of the 70s because uh, now they are going back. Okay, now in the last decade we have a lot of novels with, you know, linguistic changes, etc. But um, there was a gap, no, from like, yeah, sort of not playing with languages anymore for a few years. So I'm going back to this. This is a very, well, this is a very feminist uh, utopia. It's called feminist utopia where you have this kind of separatist world where there are only women. Okay? We are in the 70s, so very political. Uh, and what is interesting here, okay, that uh, one of the main issues is that they communicate not speaking, but uh, through, her, through their mind, okay, through telepathy. That again, in science fiction, is something obvious, okay, that you, you can speak without speaking. I mean, a lot of people, of course, study also telepathy in our world, but, you know, in science fiction it goes beyond that, you know, it takes for granted, that is it. Okay, now let's look at this. Now, in this uh, text you have a lot of uh, neologism of words that do not exist, that they are created not to translate something different, okay, that doesn't exist. Uh, so this is okay, the explanation. So what does the author do? Because otherwise, even the reader in English wouldn't understand. Okay, she under she 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 explain. Okay, so she insert a word and then she explain the meaning of the word and what it means. You know, otherwise, it would be difficult. So this would be more translatable as a text, but it has never been translated, at least in it into Italian, but also into French because I checked and it is. Um, so here, okay, she uh, is talking about enfoldment. Now, the, I, I immediately, as a linguist, I think, okay, now which is the root? <laughs> now, is there a prefix? What is it? You know, from which word does it come, of course. But you can do that or you cannot do it. You can just read, okay, the, the explanation. The three things also join one another, seeking a rhythm, a unity, and uh, always a character, but doesn't matter, seemed to drift deeper to all more seriously all the sensations she was about to share. <laughs> the concern for the listener was Alaka's job. Uh, Clara could sense her friends waving in and out of the open channels, assuring each that any listener could receive as much or as little as she wished of the narratives. Okay, so what do you understand? I mean, you have not read before you don't know okay so i know it's more difficult but what do you understand just reading okay the explanation do you understand what they are doing they are communicate communicating uh, but uh, a lot of people seem to communicate uh, without language like there are different people that can access the, the dialogue uh, and choose what they want to hear and perceive uh, while someone is giving information. Okay, so we understand that they are not speaking, so they are communicating like, yeah, with telepathy, okay, with their minds, okay. Uh, we have some words uh, that are, you know, in English, so breathings, so we understand probably they are breathing now we think about well, my idea goes immediately to someone that is relaxing like you know when you breathe deeply and I don't know in the dark <laughs> and then you have um, yeah you also have drift deeper okay then you have share to share okay so you understand that someone is sharing okay a thought okay uh, with someone else 
you you have uh, the term listener okay, that we know what it means not to listen to someone but they are not listening uh, the voice and then we have uh, uh, receive hmm? so we understand someone is yeah, getting some information and then maybe something a bit more difficult weaving in and out of the open channels okay now if you have read it up to now you know that they uh, gather okay instead of talking to each other they think about the discussing just you know uh, being there together and their minds not communicate uh, together okay and there is one person so they they understand immediately they perceive so it's it's a kind of body sensation no more than the voice they perceive if someone is speaking okay is communicating and they just listen okay um so weaving in and out of the open channel the open channel is the idea that you know you leave your body open and you know you're not uh, kind of like that now you you you're open to listen not to someone else that if you think about it is the basic of communication or in many cases we misunderstand someone because we don't listen okay or we listen from our own perspective okay so this again we understand immediately okay that is one of the plot okay issues and and device to go on now Look at my French, that is really bad, I know, because this is very long. In fact, I translated just the first three lines and then I said, mm, then I stopped. So maybe there are also mistakes, okay? So let's look at the Italian, the one that can read Italian, of course, and that is also mine. Uh, hope it's better than the French one. <laughs> and you tell me, okay, if it makes sense. If you think, you know, that uh, for a French reader would make sense and if you would translate it in a different way. Because here we don't have, you know, neologism. We have English words that are used in a different way. To me, the French makes sense. I don't know. It makes sense? Yeah. 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 And I thought a lot about the les soucis. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, difficult. the concern. Le souci pour les auditeurs, I don't understand. It can mean different yeah. things. Ah, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was difficult. Um, Because the concern for the listener means that their job was to be sure that anybody could listen and could speak, you know, that there could be communication. This is the idea in, in the novel. Yeah, yeah. Should we yeah. say l'attention maybe in French? Yeah, in Italian, yeah, I, I was, it was easier. I, I wrote uh, prendersi cura. Uh, how is in French? Please. <laughs> um, um, se préoccuper, faire attention à. Okay. Si, faire attention. Se soucier de. Okay. Mm. So you take care of somebody, no? So this is, uh, yeah, that is, uh, as you see, it's completely changed. No, the concern for the listener, I mean, I could translate it literally in Italian, but it didn't make sense, you know? So the idea was to take care of somebody. So this was my idea, but this is, you know, I don't know, the translator is, is difficult. Okay, now, now this I'm going to show you some words uh, and uh, you're going to try to translate them in French. Okay. So, informant is what we thought, okay, what we just read. Uh, now, as you can see, there are a lot of words, okay, that are made of, uh, for example, two verb, listen, and spread or you have a, a verb or a noun where depending. Can you understand the meaning of uh, listen spread uh, without uh, there is no explanation. Eh? This is my uh, kind of analysis of what it is made of. Can you understand listen spread? What comes to your mind? Understood as um, receiving, like, uh, 
in this image and then projecting what yeah, so this is the idea. Okay, so how would you translate it in French? Can we do the same? Or play? Écoute? Okay. Does it work? Yeah? Écoute étendue. Écoute étendue? Okay. <laughs> yeah, then you have, uh, 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 you see, there is always something connected to either the mind or one of the senses, okay? Now here you have mind sweep, that of course, you know, if you look at the English, can, you can have, oh sorry, a lot of, uh, a lot of meaning, so you understand it only when you read it, that it means they were trying to sort of clarify their thought, okay? So this was the idea, and in fact, you know, you if you think about mind sweep, you know, <laughs> the practical translation of sweep, yeah, is the one that gives you an idea of what it means. Because some, some uh, actually, words are explained, other you understand because how they are used in the text, so you understand that they are doing some action and something is happening, so as a reader, you understand what it means. Okay, so can you translate it into French, mind sweep? Uh, also in Italian, huh? I accept a translation also in Italian. Now in Italian is really bad because you know if you if you translate sweeping into Italian is then you have you know the idea of the style you know, of the literary text and you think no oh, I cannot translate it like <laughs> um, so you have to change in Italian. You could you, you couldn't use you know spazzare or something like that because it's really doesn't work. Yeah, so you, you yeah, you, you try to find yeah, that's what you do, no, you try to find the different meaning uh, and then see which one could be translated. And it, it makes sense, it means also to because in French, it means that you open your mind, that you, you can begin to think in a different way. Mm? Yeah, thanks. Yes? Okay. So it works. <laughs> I know, it's difficult. Um, now, here you have something uh, that I think you have to change, at least in, into Italian. I didn't write my Italian, but, you know, if you have a word like gather stretching, you know, that the author tells is when they take a collective decision. Okay, so the two words, gather and stretching, are very far from the explanation that means to take a decision collectively. So now you have to choose, you know, if you try to, yeah, here I, yeah, I try to find, you know, a kind of explanation. Um, if you want to keep, okay, and, and look at the different possibility uh, from English into your language, of the two words, or if you have not to look for something completely different. So what is more important then for you in order to uh, communicate the same idea? I mean, the easier one would be, you know, to use uh, they are taking, you no, know, their collective decision, a collective decision. This would be easier. Um, if you want to play with words, would you find something that could work? In French, also in Italian. <laughs> Sometimes, if you are a translator, you choose the easier way. I mean, you know, of course, but uh, if we have to think about, no. uh, but you know, the way we are thinking, it means that they are expressing something different, otherwise we would have the words, not to translate it. Rassemblement étendu. On va avec étendu. Rassemblement étendu. Ah, okay. That means the rassemblement um, means... Rassemblement uh, Okay, okay. Hmm. In Italian? <laughs> <laughs> Stavo 
cercando qualcosa con comune. Ah, ok. Però boh, ho la metà, ma non nel resto. <ride> Pensiero comune? Magari sì. O riflessione comune. Riflessione comune. Yeah. But you imagine you are a reader, ok? And you are reading uh, something that, so in Italian it must be like in the English or in French it must be like in the English, no, that you read it and you think, oh, no, this is something I don't know, no, this is something I have to think about. So, um, yeah, these are examples that make you understand that uh, the, the, they force you, okay, to think about something specific and, uh, of course, connected to different action, no, different... Okay, now this is the last, okay? I promise, but this is the last. So it's a bit longer. Uh, if you read uh, the English, okay, it's a conversation here. Do you understand what they are talking about? So we go back to having, you know, words in English, but they have a complete different meaning from the usual one. <laughs> Just to help you, they're still there, okay? They're still there, gathering together. So they're still communicating uh, and, yeah. So they are explaining to each other some action that they did, okay, through their minds, okay. So there is no involvement of anything physical, okay. So it's, again, it's a, a kind of mind conversation. So the term to touch that for us is really physical, okay. Here is is used in a diff completely different way. It means to touch, but with my mind, okay? So how would you translate it? What is your idea? I had to touch? To connect. To connect. In, in French you have, se connecter, no? Mm. Oui? oui? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anche noi, connettersi. Mm? Interesting, no. I think in French I would keep the verb toucher. Okay. Uh, this is my question <laughs> at the end. But, yeah. I think yeah. Okay, so you think that from yeah the rest of the text, uh, the reader would understand anyway that the, the touch is a mental touch. Um, I think it's not just understanding, but it's like if the author uses that word, there's a meaning behind it. So mm -hmm. you can't like purpose, like there's purpose, so you can't change it, even if you think it's not clear enough. But I, I don't know if I'm making sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know that we say there are many translations, you know, and that you, you choose w which one convince you most. So if you think that is more important to explain uh, and give an idea of what is happening and uh, that is coherent, let's say, with the narration, okay? you do it. Otherwise, if you think that, you know, the verb anyway, yeah, makes you understand uh, what is happening and the story and yeah, this is a choice, you know, when you have a lot of choice in translation, we never say so. The only thing is to be a kind of coherent, that's the only thing we know that, you know, if you make this decision at the beginning, yeah, you keep it until the end and you won't choose, you won't change, sorry, uh, the term um, that uh, the author has chosen. Uh, so, and similarly, you know, uh, we were discussing to touch, but similarly, yeah, if we look at to stretch, we go back to to stretch, and you know, some verbs are and some noun, of course, are repeated. You have a lot of uh, compound, okay, created with the same verb and noun, etc. Okay, well, this was, uh, yeah. So, my final question is, okay, um, can you think about any? text uh, that uh, made you think in this way uh, about, you know, the language, the use of language, the use of neologism or the way yeah, we perceive uh, uh, things through language, anything comes to your mind, can be also not science fiction, it's just a question. Uh, 1984. Okay, so we go back to Orwell, yeah. 
that also no, communication and language is uh, yeah, one of the theme of the... Uh, it's more recent book, but uh, Art Punk's Bible. Okay. Oh, yeah. Our students like this uh, text. Uh, they like it very much. <laughs> yeah. And the left hand of darkness by Ursula Le Guin. Ah, yes. But I only read the translation in French, and it made me think about how it could be written in the original version. Because, OK. Uh, in French, they, didn't, they translated it in a very gendered way. And I wondered if uh, in English it was more useful. Not so much, and this was one of the criticism uh, towards Yusuf Aligin. Now that the topic was very much about this, we are talking today, but then the language uh, was not too much. In it, in Italian, it's been retranslated, I think, uh, one year ago. Um, yeah, thinking about this, but she has changed. I mean, the translator uh, she has changed uh, the source text. Okay, she has made it more explicit because in the source text. No, because it was again seventy-eight or something like that, and yeah. So the topic is very much. I would I would have thought about the same book. I mean, the topic is very much you know central uh, to our topic today. But yeah, linguistically she d she didn't she didn't do any change in uh, in the English language. So it was like she or he or yeah. So it was like he, and then he was wearing a skirt, for example. Now I don't remember now by heart, but no, the idea is uh, so using the masculine and yeah. But uh, she didn't change the pronoun. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, why do you like science fiction? <laughs> why do you like si which science fiction do you like? Uh, any any science fiction that you read or or watch uh, made you think about this, our discussion today? I'm not sure if it's a science fiction movie, okay. uh, but uh, The Clockwork Orange, uh, uh, because they have uh, some words. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So why do you like it? I think it's interesting. I mean, it's an interesting story. Um, I like the soundtrack, uh, uh, how it uh, explains a bit the society and how society works. And, um, Okay, so it's about again, anyway, thinking about society, values, etc. Okay. Uh, someone, ah, okay, I saw some, someone. Um, last year I was doing a translation master's degree actually, um, and I chose to translate the first chapters of Time Enough for Love by Robert Eilein. Gender and language are not the center of the plot. However, I had many issues with translation because, well, the plot is it's on another planet um, and gender does not matter anymore. It was written in 73, actually, a period in which um, well, still gender mattered. There were many stereotypes. Women couldn't do this or that job. Men were in the military, army. Women were teachers, etc. In, the, in this book, it doesn't matter anymore. A woman can be anything, even, I mean, the higher ranks of the army or whatever. The thing is, uh, especially in the beginning of the book, we don't know the gender of these people because they are wearing suits, complete um, space suits. <laughs> and the main character was born in 1912, actually, and now he's in the future, and he doesn't understand that, mm -hmm. and he assumes gender. But, in the narration, we have to remain neutral, but French is not neutral. I mm. had so many issues translating that. The thing is, I had to be really careful in the beginning, choosing my words carefully in French, because after, um, in the middle, end of the book, we realized that, well, there's another language on that planet, and we realized that this language is not purely neutral, I mean, it's really inclusive, but when we want to use the, something neutral, we have to use the feminine, actually. So I had to be careful in French in the beginning, so as to show afterwards this difference um, in the language construction. Um, the teachers that corrected me uh, were not really happy with my choices, <laughs> said that I went too far in trying to be neutral. Mm. Um, and I was um, 
I don't know. Well, I was stressed and obviously so I didn't know how to react. But I didn't know how to really defend my choice. I mean, how there was no other choice for me. I don't know how should I should I do it if I want to present this book to a publisher. I don't know. And yeah, this is um, interesting thinking about it. Should I defend this feminist, this neutral point of view, or not? Because you thought that a translation of the neutral language was important in the translation of the work. I, I thought it was yeah. really important because I, even though it's, uh, yeah, as I said, 1973, nobody, barely anyone was thinking about those uh, gender uh, issues. But I line, I, I know, it just, it's really clear in the narration that he's playing with this, um, with with his language, he knows that English is neutral, and he's playing with that. Um, so, I mean, even if it's an old book, I mean, I had to show that this author, living in a world in which no one was thinking about that, he thought about that. So I have to think about that if I want to translate. I mean, that was my that was my thought about it, but apparently. Not everyone agrees. <laughs> readers are different. But this uh, takes us to another question that is uh, the period of when you translate the book. You know, that is the other issue. You know, I translate a book that now, here is 73, so it's not so long ago, but it's, it's in a way, it's long ago. I mean, I understand your point that, you know, there were less discussion about this issue, but the language, okay. But, you know, when we translate, you know, books that are from the 17th century, etc., we have this problem of how you do it. I translate it. Do I have to kind of modernize it or not? And so these are, yeah, I know. I mean, uh, that's why I find translation um, a very interesting, you know, field. Uh, uh, yeah. And the book has been translated in Italian, actually. Yeah. And sometimes I was trying to compare, yeah. only because some sentences, some passages were too hard to translate. I had to have another language to help. And they barely worked on that which I thought was a shame because Italian is really, really gendered. Um, so, yeah. But I yeah. think it's an interesting, um, an interesting book to study in that. And this is what you do, no? When you are a translator, you always look at previous translation or translation in a language that you master more. But this is right, I think. Well, um, well, je vous remercie beaucoup <laughs> pour cette conversation et merci beaucoup. I hope I didn't take too much time, did I? Uh, we have a few more minutes for questions. So if you have, si vous avez des questions, alors pas, en, enfin, pas pour moi en italien, mais pour, <laughs> euh, on aura en français ou en anglais, on va prendre cinq minutes pour les questions. Après, je signerai les, les papiers, etc. Euh, et il faudra remettre les chaises à leur place. Mais si vous avez des questions à poser... Euh, Now's the time for questions or remarks. Maybe we've um, been through a bit. Have you, I know you're a translator yourself, have mm. you translated this kind of literature or is it something? Yes, I translated oh, okay. uh, yeah. Doris Lessing, uh, uh, Canopos in Argos. Okay. The first volume actually, not the second one because translating takes a long <laughs> a lot of time. So if you want to translate it well and think about all, not only this issue but uh, so I translated the first volume because it was really, really long. So it took me a lot, a lot almost, I think, one year to translate well. I mean, to look and revise, etc. So the second and the other volume were translated by... With the second translator, we had a lot of exchanges in order not to try to keep uh, with the other. No, uh, I didn't. And then I translated some other um, short story. I mean, talking about science fiction. But I like it a lot. I would like it. I would like to translate it, but it takes a lot of time. And the problem is if you know to find publishers that are interested into it because we have one or two publisher in Italy that publish science fiction is considered really as kind of mass popular literature and uh, no so it's uh, yeah I think they are difficult texts you know the text uh, dealing with uh, neologism and, and also feminist issue are, are a bit difficult to propose I mean you are, you need the time but I like it I mean I, I I'm trying to Sometimes to translate bits and bits also in my classes, and I would like to do it, but yeah, it takes uh, takes a lot of time. Sorry, may I ask a question? Um, I was wondering how 
you manage to reconcile your feminist concerns <laughs> or, um, and uh, the notion of fidelity <laughs> that you mentioned. Um, that I, I'm thinking about it because I'm working with some students on a book from the 1930s mm. in which uh, the American author, like many Americans at the time, is, has very uh, matches matches position mm -hmm. the result of the first world war mm -hmm. as a result of the first world war so how would you how do you manage that well this is what i was telling at the beginning i mean if you have this kind of text i think you should translate it as it is otherwise you change completely okay the author uh, that's message the, so, that's so, the yeah. reason for my question yeah. no no that's why that's what i said you know so i understand some criticism towards feminist strategies and theories I mean, depends which text you are working with. I mean, with Einlein, okay, it's not a feminist, but if you have a language that try to be neutral, I think, yeah, fidelity means you have to try to find something similar. But if we are talking about that, that has nothing to do, okay, uh, and the, the even, you know, you, ca you cannot like it, but it, this is it. You know, in fact, as a translator, I think it's difficult to translate anything. I mean, if you don't like the text, it's very difficult. I think I wouldn't translate that because it would be very difficult for me, you know. I mean, yeah, because you must... Uh, you go and you enter in the text, no, you, yeah, yeah. So if you don't like the idea, I mean, you know, if you don't like, it's, it's more difficult. Then if you are a professional, you do it. But yeah, but at this point, you know, if he has this point to you, it must be kept because this is, yeah what it is so I mean we cannot change completely yeah mm. um, yeah uh, I think we could uh, in my opinion you know thinking about that you we, we could use a more inclusive language in our everyday life so we could do that when we translate I think any novel because meaning that you can not use always no the, the masculine and you can translate it well and keep the same message on the other hand yeah if you have texts where uh, the issue uh, of gender language is central. You sh you should you, you should uh, do something more. I mean, you should try to uh, because it's in the text. If you have a text that has nothing to do with it, no, I no, I think you yeah, fidelity is also you know to keep the text yeah. as it is. Uh, yes, because it, it would be a real concern. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if in some parts it could be used a more inclusive language without changing the author aim. This I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. this is yeah the only maybe passage that we I could think about changing something but uh, you know it depends you know if you mm. if you change completely the author intention no because otherwise you read some someone else <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay thank you no. I think there was a question no when you explain speak up when you just explain they had a clear idea of uh, the question uh, I want to ask about uh, inclusive language. So I, I understand that uh, it's important to to make changes when it's pejorative. Mm. But sometimes when there's not really an issue um, with, uh, with the terms used, uh, I think it's okay to, to leave it as it is. I, I had a clear idea when you just mm. explained it. Ah, okay, yes. <laughs> Yes, I think one very banal example I made at the beginning, you know, you, uh, like you can say humankind instead of saying man, and this I think we can do it without changing too much, but we change a bit our idea. Yes. Here it's, uh, it's, um, it's useful and important to, to change the term, but for example, um, for the example of director, for example, in mm -hmm. French it's uh, director, directrice, mm -hmm. um, here I, I don't see why we need an inclusive language mm. since it's part of the French language but and, and it's not really pejorative. Oh yeah, but I ask you, do you say, when I was talking about orchestra, no? Um, uh, do you say orchestra? Orchestra. In, orchestra. Uh, do you say in, in French, uh, directrice d'orchestre? Oh, it sounds weird because it's always a man. This is my question. Chef. 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 Ah, chef. chef. ah okay. I know in Italian, uh, direttore, direttrice. Allora, chef. Uh, a chef is masculine. 
No, you can, it can well, be orally it's the same, but you can spell it with two F's and an E now, ah. and that's that's become quite ah. usual. Well, ah, that's okay. Allora, no, allora un altro esempio. Uh, for instance, in French we have pr professor. Okay. And uh, I wouldn't put an E at the end. I do. Uh, but <laughs> me too. Because it, uh, for me, I feel it doesn't matter whether I am a man or a woman. I'm just uh, a professor. And uh, and there's no problem for me, uh -huh. but I don't know. Maybe maybe I am a problem. It's no, just that no, no, I, no, I, no. I feel I feel that I'm a professor. Yeah, I like the the the, the, the British for it, and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's masculine or feminine. It's just that this is, uh, and uh, it's uh, always been the same. I I don't know. But, <laughs> I don't know what you feel. Well, it's good that we don't. We are not the same in this world. I mean, no, I do. I, I put an A. <laughs> and this is my battle in the equal opportunities of my university. I'm trying to change, uh, yeah, this. I mean, because it means uh, that if you use the masculine, it means that you're a professor and the majority, that is true, because if you look at the graphics, the majority, especially full professor, are men. So this is a... Not here. Area. Not, not for, oh, for us it is. It's changing, yeah. It's, it's yeah, so ah, very it's good. Really I come to France. Oh, yeah. English, <laughs> oh, no. There's a lot of women. Full professor? Yeah. Director of department? Yes, no. director of... The, oh, this is very good. Well, well come and tell us how... <laughs> No, no, I mean, even if we have a woman rector now, I must say, uh, and so she has chosen a lot of women, of course, but no, it's... Uh... We had a president as head of this university um, four years ago. One. Yeah, we had one. Uh, okay, I've been, I've been, I was a student here and I'm a professor uh, and for the, like the 30 years I've spent at the university, there was, there was one woman. There was another... Uh, uh, Madame <laughs> Oh, no, two, uh, two yeah, actually. That's the reason yeah. why. Yeah, but I didn't sure. realize because it was not here. So. Yeah, but uh, I don't feel that. B b personally, I don't feel challenged by mm. the masculine form. Mm -hmm. This is b personal yeah. opinion, personal mm. feelings. Of course. There was a question at the back. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good question. Okay, uh, comment. It's just to refer to the words uh, auteur and autrice that mm. we've got in French also. Um, I listened to a podcast yesterday or the day before uh, saying that not uh, putting the feminine form implied that women didn't have their place in the writing world and that uh, if they referred to themselves as author instead of autrice, sorry, <laughs> good accent there, um, then it was because uh, they didn't want to take too much space, sort of, uh, and also it wasn't their place to be part of the writing world. Um, so I think it's important to put them at the end of because if you don't, in my point of, point of view, uh, then that implies that it's uh, only for men and that not putting an E at the end of it would mean that it's more classy, uh, sort of. No, oh, yeah, I, of course I agree with you. I just say something. Uh, Sometimes I, after what I said, I found it difficult to use some words. For example, one example that the Italian will understand me, uh, some uh, scholar, very few, but some scholar use the term personaggia, that is the feminine for personaggio, that is character, that in Italian doesn't exist. Okay, so they have decided to use it. <laughs> I mean, I found it difficult because it doesn't exist, you know. But is we go back to what they are doing in science fiction. So I myself, I have to correct. Otherwise, I would say personaggio femminile. Okay. But this to say that, yeah, I mean, so it's, it takes time, I think. Also, when you think that, you know, uh, for you it's important to change something, but it takes time because it sounds a bit weird, you no? Know, in some cases. I gave you this example because in Italian, how does it sound, personaggio, for the Italian? Uh, <laughs> yeah, for me too, it sounds like, what is it? But then you, you think, okay, now I have to use it because otherwise, blah, 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 theory, theory, and then I say personaggio, no, you must be coherent in your life. So you say personaggio, but then when I say it, I'm like, I found it weird. Yeah, so it's difficult. Yeah, I have another question that has just occurred to me. Uh, how do you, again, uh, reconcile, combine, associate, <laughs> Uh, this no, the, the developing, no, developing notion of gender fluidity that is uh, um, erasing gender that is developing among young people, particularly in the United States, and this, what I would call, 
feminization, though it cannot exist, but I, at least I have invented it for now, uh, of, uh, uh, of words in translations. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 this is, if you, on the one hand, the, the, in the vanguard, we have people erasing uh, uh, genders and uh, gender specificities. And on the, uh, that is uh, in the new world, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And here, in the old world, we are, um, by contrast, we are emphasizing uh, fem femininity or, uh, well, the feminine gender, whatever you want to call it. So how do you... Because there seems to be a contrast between the two trends. Um, now, I'm, 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 I'm replying beginning with the linguistically point of view. Okay, In Italian, um, well, there are a lot of... Uh, this is a controversial issue in Italy, in Italian society. That, that's, that is for sure. So you have two opposite sides of you know, people talking about the issue of transgender. So the interesting is that linguistically, you don't translate. You use the English. Okay, so you use a term like transgender or other term in English, okay, that uh, speak about uh, these new ideas, representation, etc. Because you wouldn't know, I think they wouldn't know, I, I have two ideas. I think first, they wouldn't know how to translate it. Second, if you read it in English, it's not like reading into Italian, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, you understand, like the majority understand, but up to a certain point. Or third, they have a very negative attitude that is to translate badly. You know, if you if you say teoria del genere in Italian, now if you speak among academics and other people, they know what it is. Uh, if you look at and read it in the newspaper, uh, it's completely different. Okay, it's a kind of rewriting by the Catholic uh, Church and Party about the idea that you know, a very negative idea about it. You now that you know, all this uh, will uh, kind, of, uh, kind of brainwashing for young people, etc. I don't go into the rhetoric, of course, of the of the right wing, but this is it. So it's. Uh, um, what I want to say that I think that it's difficult. It depends a lot on the context, not the way I think you can speak and talk about issues and how you decided to do it. Because last year, uh, Pascal had, had invited an American translator, mm -hmm. and uh, she explained to us uh, that uh, <laughs> her daughter wanted to be referred to as they. Mm -hmm. And not as she. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we mm -hmm. were. Um, early, uh, I was very amazed at, mm -hmm. at, at that. I didn't realize it was going that far. Mm -hmm. But it means that, which means that our um, assertion of uh, gender specificity. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, is it old-fashioned? You know, is it already or old-fashioned compared with this trend, which is to uh, erase uh, gender specificities, this trend that is developing um, on the other side of the Atlantic. But, um, I would say that it's not erasing gender specificity, it's just talking about uh, yeah, genders uh, in different way. It, I think it goes beyond the gender uh, feminine and masculine, no? It says no, there are all the, also yeah. other genders, but it's not, I don't think you erase what, you know, what you don't erase feminine and masculine. You just say, okay, but there are other individuals that feels in a different way that they want to be defined in a different way. So you add something to it. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. But Thank you very much. Uh, to translate it into Italian now, mm, it's uh -uh. difficult. I mean, we do it, but it's difficult. I mean, yeah. There are two questions. <laughs> I agree with you. I think it's about creating a new category more than raising gender, it's just like the langage of inclusive in French. It's not about uh, raising men and women, it's about keeping it, but like adding a neutral position. So I don't think actually it contrasts like using uh, feminine and uh, um, using neutral in, uh, in translation. I think it can actually complete each other. Um, as a gender fluid person uh, who uses they them pronouns in English, um, I would say that, well, as you said, it's just it's, it's not about erasing because being non binary, which is a non umbrella term, there are many genders in the non binary umbrella, 
it's not erasing, it's adding, because actually being non-binary, it's, it's, when you say I'm neither female nor male, it's, it's not that you don't have a gender, you have another gender. So, or you have a combination of gender, that's also possible. And in language, um, well, if you take French, for example, we are not yet at um, a point in which we accept commonly to say autoris, traductoris, mm. all of this is just not even worse in Italian. Um, but the fact that we still try to use those words sometimes... But we, say, we can say traductrice, what's the problem? No, traductoris, it's a, a combination of two words. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's non-binary. <laughs> non we are not yet there. No. Right? But just the fact that we are trying to at least use more feminine forms or coin new feminine forms, it's already changing the point of view because well, first, before we only had male point of view, the fact of trying to give space to, the, to this female point of view is already, um, how could I explain that? Um, it's already um, creating a spectrum because you have two points of views, right? But two extremes, I would say. But necessarily, there, are, there is something in between. Life is not black and white. So when you start adding a second point of view, well, in a, in a certain implicit way, you're also adding mm, all those points of view, views in, in, in between, right? Um, so we're not so different from uh, English speakers, actually. We're getting there. And <coughs> trying to use more feminine forms is already doing the same thing as the American do in some way. I'd say it's we go in a more slow way, right? Uh, we still have to get to a point where we use completely gender neutral things, but adding feminine is already doing that actually. We're not so different. It takes time. Yeah, well, the, the, I, I agree with you, but in, you know, in French we have yell and all the. Uh, um, they're not accepted. Well, it depends who you're talking to, so it really depends on the community, <laughs> but you know. Everywhere. Yeah. Even in English, if you're talking to yeah. someone, of course, you yeah. Agree with that. But w the point I wanted to make is that there is a specificity of French, and I think Italian is that it's a gendered language, and so even with yet when I use it, you know, I try to make it neutral, but then it's very difficult because you have to gender at one point. So when you have adjectives, and so sometimes it, it is kind of like a dilemma. You don't really know how to speak. And it makes communication difficult. But yeah, we were. I'm, I agree with you. You know, on that one, what you were saying. It's just that it, the difference with French and English is, I think, there the, yeah. the gender, the grammatical gender yeah. issue. But in yeah. Romance languages, that yes. Yeah. Still a gap, but I mean, mm. language is I mean, constantly evolving. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I know some people, some um, translator, women actually, who are trying to create inclusive. Dictionaries, hmm. uh, inclusive grammars, and things like that. So we try to hmm. go yeah. to a more neutral language. Yeah, they, they do exist, I know, but it's just that they're not common yet, and oh, yeah. they're not out there. I mean, it's difficult to actually use them, and you know, in a regular language, it's just you, you can't, well, it's difficult to use. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it my is. opinion. It yeah. Is. yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up, okay? Thank you very much for being here today and for all your questions. And let's have a round of applause. Oh, okay. Um, we, we have a, a, um, a two-day <laughs> conference on October the 12th and October the 3rd. And uh, the title of this uh, conference is Challenging Categories. So you, we will continue to speak about uh, similar issues to a certain extent. Could you repeat the date, please? October the 12th and October the 13th. And, uh, the, the, and uh, the next seminar is uh, October the 29th, I think, but you will have, uh, 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 it will be 
uh, on the on Kima's website or on the universe. 27th, thank you. October 27th. Uh, it will be on Klima's website and on the university website. <coughs> thank you very much. And the room will be, uh, from what I remember, Office 700. So you are all welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.